Thank you for your attendance. We'd like to thank on behalf of my fellow speakers today, the South by Southwest Organizing Committee for this great opportunity to share our session with you today. My name is Jess Gwynn, and I'm a research physiologist from the US Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine. And we're very excited to share our talks today entitled Optimizing Human Performance Through Nutrition. I'll first begin with defining nutrition to give us a place to start and build on when we consider a perspective of performance nutrition. So as many of you might be aware, nutrition really encompasses all the foods and beverages that we consume across days, weeks, months, and years that are used to maintain health and wellness and meet our body's requirements. So then when we shift to consider the things that might impact performance nutrition, there are really five tenets. And first, nutrient requirements. So this encompasses the macronutrients, vitamins, and minerals that our body needs to maintain, again, health, wellness, and the ability to maintain our body status. When we move beyond nutrient requirements, performance really requires specific energy needs. So this is the amount of fuel that the body takes in in order to produce and perform in an event. We also consider hydration status. This is the body's fluid content, including electrolytes, and this becomes increasingly important because when we see shifts of fluid or dehydration of one to 2%, this is associated with distinct performance declines. Now we'll start to consider activity-specific fueling. And this is very important because this is the opportunity to individualize at the group level or at the individual level to a specific activity. And one way to consider this activity-specific fueling is to compare an endurance athlete that may be performing in a marathon compared to a high jumper. Those are very distinct, different entities, and so their activity-specific fueling will change. And lastly, across athletes, especially our soldier athletes, our performance events don't occur in a vacuum. And typically, once one event ends, our preparation phase for the next event begins. And so recovery refueling is the right time to bring an individual back up to baseline and start preparing to perform again. So we in the Army Nutrition research space are focused on human performance challenges that are very unique to our soldier athletes. However, as I walk through these unique challenges, I'd also like you to consider how these may apply to the professional athlete, to the weekend warrior, mother of three who's pre preparing for a, a marathon coming up, and consider how, while may not in the most extreme cases, these performance challenges affect all. First, extreme energy expenditures. For soldier athletes, we ask them to carry large loads, move across long spaces of distance, and perform in extended periods of time. This results in extreme energy expenditures. And what I mean by that is the body performing and burning energy and their inability to intake food or energy to match that output. Additionally, in soldier athletes, we're asked to perform missions and operations outside of a nine to five scenario. This results in chronic sleep loss, which you'll hear more about today at our follow-up session. Additionally, cycling of sleep occurs because missions and operations are required to be conducted across time zones and consistently over time. Moving beyond sleep loss, we ask soldier athletes to go and perform and train in extreme temp temperatures and austere conditions. This includes Arctic weather, high heat, desert, humid locations. Additionally, we may ask soldier athletes to go and perform in high altitude, which presents its own series of unique challenges, oftentimes with a limited ability to acclimate to that environment. So the first few challenges I presented today are really focused on the physical environment. We also consider the psychological and cognitive environment, including high cognitive demand. Oftentimes, these are high stakes, high stress scenarios when an individual is asked to make quick decisions, lead their fellow peers, and return home. Lastly, at the end of the day, our soldier athletes are certainly still human, and so their immune function is also acting like the general public's, in which these high stress scenarios often causes an inability to rise with immune, rise to immune challenges and this may increase their um, susceptibility to sickness over time. 
And so in the Army performance nutrition space, we really f focus on these challenges and how they may change nutritional requirements and impact an individual's ability to perform and complete their event. I'll pivot a little bit to unique information about the US Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine located in Natick, Massachusetts. So at our research institute, we're focused on the mission of providing solutions which optimize service member health and performance through medical research. And it's important to note, while we do serve Army service members, our information and our knowledge products are translated across the, the service branches in the DOD. Within the US Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine, we have the Military Nutrition Division. And here we conduct biomedical research based on five main tenets. First, again, defining service, nutrition, service member nutritional requirements. And this is because we do realize that nutritional requirements are shifted by those unique challenges and may differ from the general public. Second, we're highly focused on providing the best evidence basis to guide doctrine which serves our service members. And this is in the form of Army regulations as well as doctrine including the Military Dietary Reference Intakes and Army Regulation 40-25, which you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen really pr provides the nutrition and menu standards that are touching every one of our service members. For example, Army Regulation 40-25 dictates the foods and nutrients that are required to be provided in cafeteria settings at home duty stations. So beyond, beyond defining foundational requirements and guiding doctrine, we also are focused on maintaining medical readiness as well as optimizing and enhancing human performance. And the most easy way to consider this is how we optimize ration foods with our partners at the Natick Soldier Systems Center in the Combat Feeding Division. And so with them, we provide the evidence basis to update formulations for rations that service members consume in the field setting or in the training setting. So you might be asking, how does our tightly controlled research setting actually get applied out into the real world? On the left-hand side, I have some great photos of some of our recent human research volunteers. And these individuals are willing to participate in our research programs, which are focused, again, on cognitive function, improving fueling during performance-based activity, like running and carrying a load under a ruck march, we're also focused on understanding and supporting muscle and bones skeletal health and overall understanding the unique nutritional requirements through biological testing. And this information is then translated through evidence-based products. The main three products that we translate really focus on one, as I mentioned, army regulations and doctrine information, two, peer-reviewed manuscripts that get published into the greater body of literature, which are then picked up and used collectively with other human performance and sports nutrition research to guide and help establish consensus statements and position statements used by our sports nutrition governing bodies, as well as other entities such as the International Olympic Committee, American Society of Nutrition, and um, the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And lastly, perhaps the most easy to understand and tangible products are transitioned into actual goods. For example, I have a photo of the performance readiness bar. So this is a nutrient bar that's provided at initial military training to our service members. And this is in an effort to minimize the risk of um, micronutrient deficiencies, particularly calcium and vitamin D. And the goal here is to provide a nutrient inter nutrition intervention that helps protect a performing athlete from the risk of things like stress fracture over time. And lastly, in the middle of the photo, you'll see one of our service members holding a ration platform. And this one in particular is the first strike ration. And this is a um, highly studied and tested and validated ration platform that uses the evidence basis from the research and then is delivering the most optimal nutrition um, to the service member while they're performing. Here I've included another example to dive a little bit further. So over the past 10 to 20 years, we focused on identifying problems that are unique to warfighters. As I mentioned, extreme energy expenditures are a problem and they're often unavoidable. 
due in part to logistical constraints, so like the inability to carry all of the food that a person would need to consume to match their physical activity, a lack of desire to eat, because many of the performance challenges I presented early on do result in a reduction in appetite or a desire to consume food, or other logistical barriers, including time to eat. And so we are focused on how that ener extreme energy expenditure results in muscle loss and an associated decline in performance. Taking that identified problem back to the lab, the past 10 to 20 years we've focused on a research program for building the evidence basis for optimal protein intake. And many of you I'm sure can identify with optimal protein intake. You walk into the grocery store, you may see a whole um, aisle of optimized protein products. Or you may go to your favorite restaurant and on the menu they've now identified this entree is higher in protein. Well, this is because protein is recognized as a strong contributor to health and wellness. And this is the same in our service members. So this research program has then moved to provide the evidence basis for optimizing potential solutions to protect muscle and overall maintain performance. The performance piece continues to be extremely important, not only for completing the mission, but also coming home safe and maintaining their health and wellness. Potential solutions that have been transitioned to our partners include optimized essential amino acid and rich protein bars, guiding doctrine that is included in um, field manuals used by our practitioners, and as well as improved ration formulations that are transitioned over time. And so with that, I'd like you to consider these solutions and how they're applied across different populations, which will be addressed by our, my fellow speakers here. And next, we'll, we will have Mandy Tyler, who is a performance nutrition uh, research dietitian with the San Antonio Spurs. Well, thank you, Dr. Gwynn, and that was just an incredible overview of the research being done um, by the Army to support performance nutrition. And as Dr. Gwen said, we're gonna now transition into the professional space and, and how do we use performance nutrition to enhance the well-being of our athletes? And I'll say that as we worked collaboratively as a group to put this session together, the overlap and performance challenges that we're trying to address were very similar. We're just working with very different types of athletes. So Dr. Gwen shared in her presentation some of the challenges the Army faces, such as high energy expenditures, uh, extreme environments, chronic sleep loss. And in professional sports, once again, although in a very different setting, we're dealing with very similar challenges. We have very, you know, our athletes have tremendous energy expenditures that we need to match. Uh, we have extreme travel schedules that result in lack of sleep. And our, our team is consistently looking for ways that we can en enhance the recovery and the health and well-being of our athletes. So within the Spurs organization, we are fortunate to have a really dynamic performance to team. And the goal of our team is how do we support the full health and wellness and performance of the whole athlete? And so our performance team, in addition to nutrition, consists of sports scientists and exercise physiologists, athletic trainers, physical therapists, uh, psychologists, our team physicians. We have a lot of data available to us. And so the question becomes, how do we apply that data to support the optimal performance of our athletes? In other words, how do we bridge the gap between the research being done in the laboratory and apply it on the basketball court? I'll also say as a sports dietitian, my job is to translate the science. My goal is to make it as easy as possible for our players to implement the nutrition recommendations that we provide. We have to remember our athletes don't talk in grams, right? And so I can't tell an athlete, with lunch today, I want you to eat 30 grams of protein. I need to tell them, with lunch today, I want you to get a chicken breast, and it should be about the size of your smartphone, because they can implement that. Similarly, when I'm telling our athletes you know, to focus on hydration during a game, telling them how many fluid ounces to drink isn't practical. Telling them how many gulps from their sports bottle to drink when they come off the court is very doable. I'll also share just um, as a performance team, we're continuously mindful of the tremendous amount of research going on in the field and trying to figure out how we can adapt that to the sports setting. In addition, we try to drive those research questions that we know will benefit our players' um, optimal performance in the future. So nutrition education is at the foundation of what I do with our athletes. I often tell our athletes everything starts with a healthy diet. We have to have a strong nutrition foundation in place, 
And once we have that in place, we can build upon that, that, that foundation with sports-specific strategies. But we're not gonna out-supplement a bad diet. <laughs> We've gotta start with that strong nutrition foundation. I think it's also important as a dietitian to meet each player where they're at. We recognize that some athletes come to us at 19 years old. They are young athletes with a tremendous amount of responsibility on their shoulders. And so working with our players, a lot of times it's starting with the basics and then adding on key sports nutrition concepts on top of that. So for example, starting with, we eat breakfast. And what does that breakfast include? Just like gas in a car, your body needs carbohydrates for energy, and how can we add that to your diet so you have energy on the court? What does a serving size look like? Um, why do we fill our plates with anti-inflammatory foods like fruits and vegetables, and why is that important to you? How do we build a performance plate? What should your plate look like on a game day versus a recovery day? So starting with the basics that we can then build upon. And that nutrition education can take place in one-on-one -on -one conversations where I'm providing meal ideas and snack ideas for the players to eat while at home and on the road. It can also be guidance on what's the best choice to eat when you're out at a restaurant, or even what's the best DoorDash order that you can have sent to the hotel, right? So providing with the education of what they need where they're at. In addition to the one-on-one -on -one education, we also try to provide learning experiences for our athletes. So going on grocery store tours is something we take our athletes on, where they can learn the basics of how do you shop? What are good snacks to keep on hand? Uh, what can you put together for a quick and easy nutritious meal in the evening that'll support your sports nutrition needs? I'll also just challenge each of you, if you've never gone on a grocery store tour, definitely visit with your local grocery store, see if they have dietitians in place who can lead you on that. I guarantee you, you will learn something, you'll, you'll get a good takeaway. And also, if you have any college kids getting ready to go off to school, make sure you take them on one, a great learning is, experience before they, they head out to school. Uh, in addition to the grocery store tours, we also do cooking demos and um, cooking classes with our athletes. Once again, trying to give them just basic kitchen skills, right? How do you hold a knife to properly chop vegetables? We want to protect those fingers, right? Um, uh, what's a quick and easy omelet? What's a good smoothie to make that can meet your post-workout recovery needs? Uh, so that nutrition education is key. And then I'll also say, in some situations, I have the opportunity to provide education and work with player chefs. In my, my world, that's the best case scenario because I can tell a chef, I want the meal to contain you know, these specific nutrients in this amount and they get the job of making it taste good. So in my world, that, that's the ideal situation. So in, in addition to educating our athletes with regards to nutrition, it's also important that we educate new players to the league on what does a typical schedule look like. And as can be seen on the slide, our NBA schedule is very demanding. We play 82 games in a season, just like every other team. This season, our team had 13 back-to-back -back games. And I think it's important to recognize that those games are not always in the same city. Sometimes they're in different cities, and sometimes they're in different time zones. So we may finish a game at 10 o'clock in Dallas and fly to Miami and get there around 2 a.m. and need to be ready to play at 7. So it is a demanding schedule. We had a 25-day stretch without consecutive days off during the season, and over the course of the season, we'll have traveled over 43,000 miles. So we wanna educate our players on, on this, and from a nutrition perspective, what I wanna do is I wanna equip our players with a game day plan. So whether they're on the home, at home playing a game or they're on the road, they're set with meal timing. I know I eat my, when I eat my pregame meal, my snacks, my recovery nutrition, and to add to this complexity, our game times may range from 12 o'clock in the afternoon to nine o'clock at night. And so they need a different plan for each day. Now, that being said, I know each of you are busy as well, right? If you travel for work, you know how taxing travel can be. If you have kids in youth sport, I bet you've gone 25 days without a consecutive day off, right? So you know the value of planning ahead, and that's something we're really working to instill in our athletes as well. So beyond the foundation of a healthy diet, when we're looking to achieve team goals, we really take an individualized approach. We know that the nutrient needs of our athletes are going to vary greatly based upon their body size and comp composition, their height, their age, their playing time, their position, their individual uh, preferences, as well as the data that we collect on our athletes. So for example, with hydration, uh, we know that the sweat rate of our athletes varies greatly from the amount of fluid that they lose in sweat, as well as the amount of electrolytes, mainly sodium, that they lose in sweat. 
And so we do sweat testing on our athletes so that we can provide individualized recommendations on what they should be consuming and the amount they should be consuming during a game to meet those needs. We need to know who our heavy sweaters are, losing a lot of fluid. We also need to know who our salty sweaters are, who lose a lot of sodium in their sweat so that we can provide those individualized recommendations. In addition, we provide individualized recommendations on total calorie needs as well as protein needs. And Dr. Gwen shared in her research that they're doing in the Army on protein, uh, we face a similar challenge with over the course of the season, our players are going so hard, so intensely, they're burning so many calories, they will lose muscle mass. And so how can we optimize the nutrition goals we provide them to help them maintain that muscle mass throughout the course of the season? We provide individualized recommendations on body composition, and I'll say with body composition, we really take a performance team approach in working with our athletes, focusing not on the weight on the scale, but what are those changes in body composition, in lean mass, in fat mass, and most importantly, what are the performance gains on the court associated with that? With our athletes, we take a food first approach when it comes to supplements, supplementing for specific reasons, uh, whether that's an individual performance game or to correct a, a deficiency, and we also take an individualized approach when it comes to recovery nutrition. And as can be seen from the schedule that I shared, strategies to, pr to promote recovery in the NBA are paramount. They're really, really important because we have such limited time between games to recover. So from a nutrition perspective, I focus a lot on nutrition nudging. How can I make it as easy as possible for our players to have the food available to them to eat post-game to meet those recovery nutrition needs? So I focus on the right food, at the right time in the right place. And that can be as simple as providing a, a post-workout shake on the chair in a locker room. So he's gonna have to move that shake before he sits down or setting up a buffet right outside the locker room doors where I know they will have to walk right past it before they head to the bus, right? So having that in mind, individual preferences is important as well. I know that some of my players are hot and tired after the game and they just don't wanna eat, but they'll drink a shake so I can accommodate them in that way. Conversely, we have some players who don't want to shake and they want a full meal, right? So we can accommodate both as well. And then also just looking at nutrition needs based on playing time, right? If you, whoever played, you know, we, we take into account how many minutes they played that night and de develop a recovery nutrition strategy based on that. Now, I will say inevitably, sometimes my best eaters are not necessarily the ones that play the most minutes that night, um, but we work on that too. So finally, I will just say as a Spurs organization, we are continually looking to the future. We are proud in San Antonio to be known as Military City USA, and we are so fortunate to have so many amazing collaborative partners within our city. So this season, we actually opened a new performance facility, the Victory Capital Performance Center, and we have plans underway for the development of a new elite human performance research and innovation center with UT Health San Antonio. And the goal of this facility is for collaborative problem solving. How can we maximize human performance in a variety of settings? So from the tactical athlete to the professional athlete, the question becomes how can we learn from one another to truly optimize human performance? So I thank you for the time this morning to share about performance nutrition within a professional setting. And now it's my honor to uh, transition to Lieutenant Colonel Bustillos, who's gonna share more information about nutrition for the soldier athlete as well as uh, holistic health and fitness. Yes, thank you, Mandy. Go Spurs, go. <laughs> Absolutely, good morning, everyone. Um, gosh, first I wanna say as I round out the panel here, uh, we really appreciate you being here this morning. When I look at the agenda of all the amazing things going on, uh, folks to listen to, um, things to see and do, we really appreciate you being here with us uh, this morning. And, and with that said, you know, I, I spent some time here um, as an undergraduate, well, a little bit, a bit more than a little time here in Austin as an undergraduate, and um, you know, I'll say it was it was back in the '90s, and, and Austin is still wonderfully weird, so it's great for it's great to be back here as well. So, um, without any further ado, again, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Brenda Bustios. I am the Chief of Nutrition Performance and Readiness in the Soldier Performance Division. Um, Office of the U.S. Army Surgeon General. And, and what we're gonna do is, is I'm gonna shift the focus just a little bit from Mandy's talk here, um, from one professional athlete uh, to another. And I'm gonna talk about how nutrition impacts the soldier athlete and how the world's largest human performance optimization initiative is helping the U.S. Army prioritize and optimize soldier performance. Now, we call this effort, as you see here, Holistic Health and Fitness, um, otherwise known as H2F, 
Um, we love our acronyms in the Army. Uh, and what, what makes this initiative holistic is, is not that it has anything to do per se with integrative medicine or alternate or alternative health and wellness, um, but holistic in the sense that our system focuses on the whole soldier, the skin in and the skin out when addressing health and fitness. Why do we need holistic health and fitness? Well, before I get to that, before we talk a little bit about that, I know it's a little bit of a busy slide. I've got some stats on here for you. Um, and we're gonna talk about why we need the, the change, but first I'm gonna tell you a little story, if I may, about Corporal Matthews. Now, this handsome young aviator uh, is Corporal J.M. Matthews, and he was a radio operator who flew in over two dozen missions with the Army Air Corps across Europe during the Second World War. Now, Corporal Matthews did not speak much about his experience in service until many decades later, which many of our older veterans um, can relate to. But one of my favorite stories is when he spoke about his recovery fuel and his nutrition following each mission. Corporal Matthews, as he would put it, would step off the flight line, which was more of like a very um, rustic, uh, um, you know, air, airfield that he had in Italy, and he would step off that flight line and walk into this morale tent where he was given a shot of whiskey and a carton of cigarettes before he hit the chow line. Now, the military, I will say, has come a long way <laughs> from where we were when my grandfather, Corporal Matthews, was in service. But much of that culture that hindered the optimization of performance still remains, right? We still hear phrases such as, hey, sleep is for the weak, right? You can, you can sleep when you're dead. Or you don't need to enjoy this food, okay? Hurry up, eat it now, you can taste it later, right? You can still hear those messages. But, but if we peel back the onion here a little bit, as, as I mentioned, take a look at this slide a little bit more. I know it's a little heavy on the words. but but this isn't just a reflection of military service, but truly a reflection of our society at large. I want to highlight a few key points on this slide. All right, first, only 23% of those eligible for military service between age 17 to 24 actually qualify to serve, right? Those who don't qualify generally don't meet um, either medical or body composition standards or both. Um, body composition being a determinant or indicator of fitness. Now, as you can see on this slide, we have the highest obesity rates among, um, in particular, Army, but service members in general that we have ever had. Our injury rates among our service members, they're staggering, they're costly, and result in many of them being placed on limited duty or being deemed non-deployable. So this is why the holistic health and fitness system, which is evidence-informed, it's a performance-based approach to optimizing soldier readiness is critical and compulsory. A little history here. Let's take a look at um, kind of the history behind those performance-based approaches. Now, performance optimization teams, as, as Mandy mentioned, work with professional and or competitive athletes and generally consist of registered dietitians, as those of us on the panel here, um, and physical therapists, as she said, occupational therapists, strength and conditioning coaches, athletic trainers, and even cognitive behavioral specialists or sports psychologists. And all these professionals work in concert to help athletes, soldier athletes, obtain their peak performance. Now, as you see here, our professional sports leagues have led the way in taking performance research, like all the great work that Dr. Gwen and her team generate, and translating that into action. Professional athletes and teams, they're, they're high visibility, um, they're high demand entities, and optimal performance often generates revenue. Right? Um, but that said, professional sports leagues have employed our performance optimization teams um, historically for over 70 years. Now, followed by the collegiate and Olympic athletes, then our special operations forces, as you, as you see here on the timeline, then the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Only in recent years has the U.S. military at large and the total army invested in performance optimization programming and resources. So similar to professional, Olympic, and collegiate athletes, our soldier athletes have high operational tempos, demanding schedules, frequent moves, 
training temporary and permanent locations that impact performance. Now soldier athletes have a comprehensive, integrated, and immersive health and fitness system that will help them stay off that injured reserve list, so to speak, and contribute them to in winning those critical home and away games, if you understand. The holistic health and fitness system addresses the physical and non-physical components of fitness through performance professionals, as I mentioned, programming, um, facilities, equipment, and the critical education piece. This is a fundamental shift in military health culture. H2F is made up of, as you can see here on the slide, the five integrated domains. We have um, physical readiness, right, we're all familiar with, um, and then mental and spiritual, and as you see here, nutritional readiness and sleep readiness, which is um, going to be discussed in our, our follow-on um, conversation panel. Though I would love to drill down on all the domains of holistic health and fitness, there's so much to talk about here and, and um, to discuss, much of which I'm very passionate about. I'm gonna stay on task and on time, and we're gonna talk about nutritional readiness there on the right side of the slide. Now, a comprehensive performance nutrition program must be, as you see here, proactive, active, and yes, even reactive. Now, this means that the program um, must provide this proactive prevention of nutrition deficiencies, right? Provide operational nutrition to help our soldier athletes with event fueling and post-event recovery, and also consider any dietary interventions that must take place to get our soldier athletes back within their optimal readiness. So much like Mandy's approach with professional athletes, we meet our soldier athletes where they are. Though the ratio though of, our, of basketballers right on the team to performance professionals is optimal. That's where we really want to be um, in the Army. Um, and unfortunately, to do that at scale is a heavy price tag and it's just even though we are a very large performance optimization program, we're just not quite there yet, but it's a, it's a start from where we are. Um, and so, you know, um, with that, we're just, if I break down this here on the proactive, active, and reactive, um, for these three elements, if I break this down here, proactive nutrition, um, also called the foundational nutrition, as Mandy mentioned, focuses on prevention of chronic disease and, and as I mentioned, nutritional deficiencies. But this aims to also enhance immune system. Now, it is essentially the foundation of how we eat, what we eat, and it's influenced by various factors, right? So personal taste and culture and also our belief system. By optimizing the base of our diets for our soldier athletes, um, we can adjust their eating behaviors and soldier athletes are more prepared to tackle those soldier specific tasks and ultimately just maintaining their overall health. Now with active nutrition, right? Operational nutrition is also what we call it. Um, the main goal is to align their eating behaviors with the physical activity that they're engaging in. So our soldier athletes can do this through their task-specific event fueling, um, and it also involves consuming the right amount and types of nutrients that are required for that occupational event that they're about to do. And then with the recovery nutrition, recovering and repairing the body after that performance and the preparedness for operating as our, as our soldier athletes do in those arduous and high stress environments. And finally, as you see here, our reactive nutrition, we also call that therapeutic nutrition, and that involves working with those who have an illness or an injury or other medical conditions in which one's nutrition plays a significant role. Now, this nutri nutrition intervention can address, of course, those short-term acute issues, such as musculoskeletal injury, stress fracture, um, to the more chronic issues, such as high cholesterol and diabetes, and we see those often um, in our mid-age to older soldier populations. Now, Mandy also highlighted nutrition education, individualization, demanding schedules for her athletes. She talked about nutrition on the go. And these considerations are no different for our soldier athletes. They just look a little bit different upon execution. So that said, I'll walk you through this rainbow here of nutritional readiness, starting on the left. 
First, for soldier athletes who are new to a unit, we provide a deliberate new newcomer onboarding that immerses our soldier athletes in this holistic health and fitness system, as well as nutritional readiness from day one. Next, we see turf talks. That, um, these turf talks are interesting. They're proven to be this effective strategy that we have developed to integrate small bites of education across all the domains of holistic health and fitness into our tactical training sessions and our physical training sessions. Now for operations integration, uh, H2F is part of the unit's training planning process and incorporates all those domains in sync um, with the tactical training and all the mission requirements and so forth. For our expert program design, we build individualized nutrition and training programs to enhance performance and reduce overall injury risk. And then you see here coming rounding around the, the bend here under medical integration, H2F is, is not a medical program. I want to be clear about that. It's a performance program, a human performance optimization um, system. So, uh, it, but saying that, it does incorporate medical providers and clinicians, as we mentioned, and these teams must be credentialed by and synchronized with their supporting medical treatment facilities on a military installation. And finally, you see their dining facility meal prep. Now, meal prep programs are widely popular, uh, but they require extensive planning, especially um, within our dining facilities. Uh, but when they're properly executed, they can improve soldier health and performance and save our soldiers uh, time and money, which is, is critical um, for them, especially for many of our, our younger soldiers. Now, there are many ways for our soldier athletes to take initiative and improve their nutritional readiness on their own. But as Mandy said, she has young athletes just as we do. They make up the majority of those in uniform. Um, and before they can start improving their own nutritional readiness, they have to step back and self-evaluate um, and, and see where they are currently in their nutrition journey. And we do that to educate um, and provide them with the resources necessary, help them consider their lifestyle behaviors, their diet quality, uh, mindfulness, and uh, which we'll talk about too in the next panel. And then also their external and personal food environment, which we know is critical to making um, the very best decisions possible. And then we assess their social support and so forth. I want to emphasize the fact that these are not stock photos, okay? What you see here is truly a snapshot, or nine, of holistic health and fitness in action. Now, our soldier athletes are not pre-positioned, they're not posed, unless they're doing yoga, um, but if you see, as you see here, our soldier athletes, um, they're learning tactical napping strategies, they're building an athlete's plate, Right, they're completing cognitive exercises, they're doing brain games, as you see there on the right. Um, they're also receiving those turf talks on topics such as sleep and mindfulness and others. Now this, as you can imagine, is a dramatic shift from the programmatic efforts of years past. And we are training our soldiers as professional athletes to improve and optimize their performance, their readiness, their resilience, and to face any challenges and any competition. So um, as I round out here on my piece of the talk, um, I'm gonna give you a few words of our soldier athletes and as a qualitative researcher myself, I'll conclude with the following quotes. The Army is doing fitness better now than ever before. We are far more advanced and the science and technology are there so we can take care of our bodies. Major General Gregory Anderson. Never before have I seen the Army make such an investment in the individual performance of our soldiers, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Pregney. And from a non-commissioned officer who chose to remain anonymous, every single change the Army has implemented has been great, and H2F is legitimately one of the best things the Army has done in years. Now, regrettably, I don't have a quote from Corporal Matthews to share with you as he has long passed on but I can say with great certainty he would be incredibly proud of how very far we've come. And with that, 
I just want to thank you on behalf of my fellow panel members for your time, your attention on our session today. And um, we will now address any questions that you may have for us. We have plenty of time, um, so the floor is yours. Thank you. I do believe we have a mic here, center room, if you would like to step to the mic. Head up, I'm a, here in Austin, head, head up a nonprofit health code. And I remember seeing this come out because I was invited to be at the Army Future Command Air Techs on Human Performance event. And I'm like, they're talking nutrition and sleep? It's like, whoa. I'm wondering, uh, through current, what were some of the specific areas of, uh, just like your grandfather, what they experienced, some of the folks I know they came back from Vietnam with. Uh, spam stomachs not working really well. <laughs> what are some of the specific things you're seeing from a nutritional change? And um, it's one thing for the Spurs, they got a lot of money for a few people for that, but it looks like you're doing amazing things on that individual basis. So I'm wondering those two things, what, what's happening there? Uh, um, I, I saw that, uh, you know, some of the things, but, but thanks for the work you're doing. You're very welcome, Steve, correct. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate that question. And, and I'll, I'll answer your first question, and I'll pass that on to kind of what that looks like for professional athletes here, to Mandy, also Jen, I'm, I'm sorry, Jess, uh, moving in. So you asked about what we're seeing um, in terms of, of nutritional change and progression. Um, I, I'll take a, a step back here and say that, you know, at, at scale, we have some, we still have kind of a situation of the haves and the have nots, right? We still have some units who are, are full, you know, where we have those teams that are fully embedded and the Army kind of has this transitional rollout plan where up to um, FY27, we should have, if, if you're familiar with Army structure, 111 brigades across the total Army who are resourced with these performance teams. So what we are seeing from the teams who do have these, these performance teams in place versus those who do not, it's, it's just mind boggling why we haven't got ahead of this many years before. Specific to nutrition, and I, I, I would have loved to have added some more anecdotes here for you, but specific to nutrition, we found that getting, you know, tackling nutrition education, skills, kind of that foundational understanding of nutrition, and then building upon that throughout a soldier's career, um, although it's only been um, maybe four to five years now in the making, um, what we found is that the outcomes in terms of musculoskeletal injuries and the decrease of that, the individuals who are less likely to have concerns with body composition um, issues, which can be uh, an indicator of whether or not you stay in the service or qualify for further service. We've seen less of those, of, of those issues within in teams that have those embedded dietitians and strength and conditioning coaches, et cetera. Um, also, I think, too, the nutrition environment as a whole. There's a greater focus on how we tackle nutrition, not just for the individual, right, but what that looks like on a military installation and beyond. Um, just which recently. In, which in, excuse me, including mm -hmm. families, yeah. I would think. Or is that next? So absolutely, we definitely have programming for our families. Holistic Health and Fitness is specifically um, targeting the soldier athlete. Um, but we have our Armed Forces Wellness Centers that provide a lot of that same education and programming for our service members and their families. So again, it's, it's um, you know, uh, we're not building Rome in one day. There's a lot of work that we can do, but my goodness, we're moving in, in a very positive direction. And I, um, I, I could sit and talk about this all afternoon, but I'm gonna pass this to my panel member. I know that he would like to, to answer that next. Yeah, I, I would just say as well, just in, in when we're trying to build this nutrition foundation, we have the San Antonio Spurs, and we also have the Austin Spurs, which are G League affiliate team, housed right here in Austin. And um, budget constraints are very different amongst our players on the different teams. And so a lot of that nutrition education we do, the HEB tour, or the grocery store tours here in Austin, is intended for the player as well as their significant other um, or their spouse to go on those tours with us so that we can build a support system around them. Because that's really key is who's gonna help them with implementing all of these go goals, especially when they're dealing with these cha chaotic travel schedules and whatnot. Thank you so much. So no more Thanks. powdered eggs. <laughs> you might find a few of those somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> especially in operettes. <laughs> I had great 
panel, Dr. Hi, good morning. so much. I, I think I actually have uh, two questions. The first one, I think just uh, jumping into what you just said, like, are there any um, learnings from your work, um, evidence-based, about, you know, so many um, um, things about nutrition that people get wrong? Is there any myth you were able to debunk that you can share with us oh. today that you felt were really um, uh, positive to how you change your approach, uh, both in sports second one, uh, is there any, um, second question would be like, is there any work being done with bridging that with, with school cafeteria so actually mm. we get better readiness for when people get to um, uh, the age to enlist in the army and they're in better position to do so? I'm going to jump in here real quick and then I'll answer uh, your first question here okay. on, on are we able to debunk any myths. I will tell you it is really difficult for our human performance teams to get, to get in front of misinformation. Right, and, and information that, that at the fingertips that we all have, right, is um, when we're, we've got TikTokers and <laughs> folks who um, are influencers who provide information that isn't necessarily um, evidence-informed, evidence-based. And so what, what's great about the teams that we have in place are they help to do that um, at, the, at the point of meeting the soldier, whether that be in education, training exercises, turf talks, um, they work to, to tackle that. And also our soldier athletes know they have the professionals at their fingertips instead of going um, to, to social media or other forms of information, they know they can ask the subject matter experts that are on their teams. And, um, and that's where we see a lot of that good stuff, those outcomes coming out because of that. And, and I'll pause here and, and uh, pass it on to other panel members for comment. Jessica, do you want to share on schools at all? Sure, I, I could speak to only what we focus on in our research realm, but I know there's a concerted effort for getting into school programs in the academic arena. Um, certainly here at UT Austin, there's researchers focus on school lunch programs, school breakfast programs, where they're trying to expand nutrition education to these younger individuals. So they have a great starting place to come in and, and work with professionals, but that's a great question. Um, we ourselves don't have a direct um, research line in the school systems. Um, however, like I said, academia partners, collaborators that we do have are focused on that area. It's a great point. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll just share when, when, with regards to working with our players and nutrition myths, it's just keeping that open line of communication. And so um, once again, it goes back to meeting the player with their ad. What are they looking for or what are they hoping to accomplish with this supplement or what they've heard on a documentary that they're bringing? And, and, and if that's not the strategy we want them to take, explaining why and pro providing an alternative as well. So meeting them in the middle, I think is really important, that open line of communication. That's great, yeah, Thank fantastic. You. Thank you. So good morning. Now, I was wondering, when you, when you kicked off the talk, you talked about some baseline nutrition, calcium, vitamin D, and things like that. And when in soldiers um, I'm from, from, from West Point, I, I know see a lot that. of our athletes yes. are, uh, <laughs> You know, it's all about supplementation, and if you don't really know where your baseline is, you just take it all and say, well, you know, as they say, then I'll, I'll accept the really expensive urine <laughs> at, the, at right. the other end. So I'm right. wondering how, how individualized do you see the future of services? And I know that this is probably easier for the Spurs than it is for the Army, Indeed. just because of the numbers. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a lot of companies spinning up around the land that are doing the blood work and, and the detailed metrics to baseline where you are and where you might have deficiencies in some, you know, magnesium and others, um, to, to, to give you that valid start point. Do you see the army? I mean, that's a huge thing to do at scale. It is. Um, and <laughs> I, I was wondering where you see that going in, in the future. That's a, that's a great. And question. also for the yeah. for the for the sports teams as well. I know it's an easier task, but I don't mm -hmm. know if it's something you do. And I thank you for that question because we are, um, my goodness, it's very timely. Uh, we are currently relooking our approved return on investment metrics. Of course, you know we are we are a very large program using um, government dollars to to um, to fund this program and to build it into this this positive these positive outcomes. So we have to we have to show that that what we're doing is good and it's working, right? Um, and so with that, right now we have return on investment metrics that have been established by our Chief of Staff of the Army, other senior leaders. We're working on 
enhancing those current return on investment metrics through just what you said, um, really digging deep on um, having baseline um, blood work and, um, and metabolic testing, and we're looking at various different ways to establish what bone density is, you know, from the minute someone puts boots on to the day they take them off, right, so that we can track and, and better understand body composition and other things. So we really are having these discussions at how we can do this and how we can make it work at scale, and not just for those who are currently active duty, but also those who are, are reserve components as well as our National Guards men and women. Um, and so uh, these, these are conversations we're having now that is the intent. It's not just uh, lip service. We're working to make that happen. So I appreciate that, and I'll pass that on to Mandy. Yeah, and I think, too, one thing with the Spurs is we're always trying to drive the research questions, right? What additional data do we need? But most importantly, if we have that data, what are we going to do with it, <laughs> right? Is that going to result in a performance outcome? Are we going to supplement based upon that? And so those were a lot of our questions come in with. You're right, we have a much smaller team. It's much easier to implement. But we kind of always go to like, well, what's the outcome if, if, we, if we look at that or we test for that? Do we have something that, that's either going to benefit us on the court or that we have an actionable item that we can do with that data? Oh, thank you. Great. Did you have a comment? Yeah. All right. Thank you. I don't know if this thing's working. Um, thanks so much. This, this is a great panel. Um, so I'm coming from the data science and cybersecurity area. And I know you're talking a lot about data that's available currently to you. I know a new trend is to utilize data scientists uh, in these fields. Have you been utilizing these folks, like actually writing code and analyzing the data that is an output from what you're doing? I'll, I'll take this Please. one. So that's a great point. And that is how we start to evolve our research. It's moving from an individual science team to these multi-collaborative efforts. And what you just said is, is right on. Um, we do have data scientists that are coming on at our institute currently um, with similar expertise to yourself. Um, and their role is really helping us elevate our science and move as technology expands. How can we take um, the, the wonderful portfolios that we have, but expand them and modernize them? And so that is an active effort. We have data scientists on board, but a, of course, also collaborate when the projects um, really require it. So that's a great question. Absolutely. And on holistic health and fitness, we have um, incredible data scientists who are helping to build our repository of data so that we can talk about that, those return on investment metrics and, all, and, and what's working, what's not, how do we tweak those things for the future. So appreciate that question as well. Yep. And, and definitely within the, the Spurs organization and professional sports in general, data scientists are, they're an integral part of our team. Mm -hmm. uh, they're helping drive us forward uh, and they can really put the pieces together. Um, so absolutely. And I see it to continue to be a growing field. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Good morning. I'm from the Netherlands working in uh, Olympic sports and professional soccer. Um, I've got two questions. One of the things that, that we see is that um, even if you manage uh, to have uh, all your information right, you've got your plan, uh, you know where you want to be going, then you run into the, the, the fact that uh, this is about behavioral change. Uh, and uh, you ladies are um, distinguished uh, scientists in nutrition. Uh, and the question, of course, is do you have the, the, the knowledge and the, the, the cross sector involvement, if you like, from, from behavioral scientists? That would be the first question. And the second is that, of course, if you look at the incredible quick development, building on a question of uh, uh, earlier question, is that sensor technology and wearables actually give you real-time information about the status of the athlete. That is def definitely uh, developing very fast. Is, is this something that you are actively uh, pursuing? Uh, and, and what is it showing you? How is it helping? Thank you. I, I appreciate it. First, great, great questions. And I'm, I'm so glad that you're asking these because we, we've got a lot of work going on that we didn't get to, to discuss with you this morning. So first, um, you asked about kind of behavioral health behavioral science behind the programming. And, and I will say, I, I was working early on in the developmental and then implementation phases of holistic health and fitness. 
And I was positioned in my job specifically because my doctoral work is in behavioral science. And so I was able to really not just get at what, what an individual can do, but then, you know, if you think of social ecological frameworks, you can think of, well, okay, great. So we've got the soldier athlete. How do we program for them? But then progressively, how do we also then program um, and, and change their nutrition environment, talk to them about their social settings, how do we reach their spouses and families and help them and support them in their journey, and then beyond, right? And, and so also now working with the Surgeon General on those policy level decisions of how we build programming better to support. So I thank you and appreciate that question. Um, and then also you talked about wearables and the Army, I mean, we're in a slouch and, and really trying to move <laughs> forward on that. We've got our, our Army's uh, Futures Command folks here also in the room who could probably talk more intelligently about wearables than myself. But I will tell you, we are piloting currently, um, I know, within, we're getting ready to ramp up a pilot within our Army basic combat trainees on wearables and we're allowing them to wear them 24 seven so that we can um, see what type of platforms are gonna work best for a soldier athlete. Um, and also really kind of consider what might work um, for those athletes you know, beyond just that training um, and, and what other mechanisms can we put in place. But I think more importantly, what can we do safely and secure that data um, because we're very concerned with that as well. But we're absolutely moving in that direction and, and I'll pass on to my panelists. Yes, uh, absolutely. I, on the behavioral health side, I, I absolutely agree. We have to remember that our basketball players are humans first. And just like each of us, everything comes down to a choice. And so we definitely try to equip them with the knowledge they need to make the best choices possible in any situation. We also do have team psychologists that work with us on the, the behavioral elements as well. And as I mentioned, we really try to set up a support structure around the athletes so that they do have you know, a support structure at home uh, in the environments that they're at to, to support them in season and out of season with their needs. Uh, I'll say wearables are not new to the professional sports setting and um, I agree with you, like that is the way of the future. Um, I'm definitely not the one to speak about it on behalf of the Spurs and, and, and next steps with that, but um, definitely we try to stay on top of emerging technology. And I think just to build on Brenda's points where um, bringing those into the research setting as well, um, the Natick Soldier System Center has an extensive wearables program as well as Eucerium testing out how do these start to integrate in physiology um, in the individual. And so that is in, in tandem with um, what Brenda mentioned about how this is still in the early phases of establishing what's, what's best practice, what's safe, and what's um, efficient for our service members. So that, that's all I'll add on to that. But things are happening and we're really excited to have an opportunity to integrate and have conversations with you all as well. Just a quick question. You ladies are aligned with the Army. Is it safe to presume the other service branches are doing similar work? Yes. Um, so what we have is kind of this umbrella a uh, concept called Total Force Fitness, right? So Total Force Fitness has been, been around a few more years longer than Holistic Health and Fitness. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we, we have other entities, you know, um, uh, our, our West Pointers who are here in the room, Go Army, Beat Navy. We've got other folks, you know, in the <laughs> so SOCOM who've also led the way in that. But as we're talking about the total force, right, each, each and every um, one of our service members, that total force fitness model has helped us with the Army say, we, we really need to get at these things and not just talk about them, right? It's, it's fun to talk about them and tell folks we're doing good things, but until we actually do good by, by our service members, then, then it's, it, it's, just, it's just talk. And so we really started to drive the train on that. Army has led the way to do that, and, and we work very closely with our, our Air Force, Space Force, uh, Navy and beyond um, the counterparts that are really trying to, to find the best way to to not only what you know where do we start but also you know how do we start with with the funding piece the programmatic piece it takes a lot of years in the making to build something uh, to this scale um, but I, I will guarantee you we're all moving in that in that direction together some of it it just looks a little bit different at execution but thank you for asking all right you have 31 seconds, so <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> if anyone's dying to ask something, now is your time. All right. Nothing heard. I will say I'll yield you back 18 seconds of your time this morning. And again, our panelists, we, we really thank you for your time and attention, and we hope you stick around for our colleagues who are going to talk about sleep and mindfulness here shortly. Thanks again. Have a great day. <laughs>